Thank you. Um, we are very tight for this afternoon and already over time, so we will move on to the next item now. Um, that concludes topical questions. The next item of business is a statement by Shirley Ann Somerville on tackling child poverty delivery plan annual progress reports 2022 to 23. I'll just allow a moment for members to organise themselves. As I said, the next item of business is a statement by Shirley Ann Somerville on tackling child poverty delivery plan annual progress report for 2022 to 3. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville. Up to 10 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Tackling poverty and protecting people from harm is one of the three critical missions for this government. It is a shared endeavour across all portfolios and indeed across Scotland. And I want to unequivocally be clear from the outset that this government is committed to driving forward action at pace and scale required to ensure that our statutory child poverty targets are met. Today, several documents have been published. I have published the annual progress report on child poverty for 2022-23. This reflects the initial implementation of action set out in the Best Start Bright Futures, our second tackling child poverty delivery plan, published last March, alongside additional action taking during the reporting year to strengthen protections in response to the cost of living crisis. In addition, recommendations from the Poverty and Inequality Commission were also published today, which I welcome. Alongside the progress report, we have published updated modelling, which estimates that, as a result of Scottish Government policies, around 90,000 fewer children are expected to live in relative or absolute poverty this year, with levels of relative and absolute poverty nine percentage points lower than would otherwise have been the case. This includes lifting an estimated 50,000 children out of poverty through the investment in our Scottish Child Payment. This considerable impact reinforces the importance of our actions to reduce child poverty. It also shows what we can do to tackle child poverty head on with our limited powers and fixed budget and that we can make a difference. Presiding officer, I am however acutely aware that I am doing so with one hand tied behind my back. It is only with the full powers of an independent nation that governments can use all levers such as economic, social security Members. and employment to tackle poverty Ca inequalities. Cabinet Secretary, sorry, can I just remind all members there should be no interventions or interruptions? Um, grateful, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Recently, we have seen a cost of living crisis and the most challenging economic conditions in living memory, which no one could have predicted when Best Start Bright Futures was published. This has caused unprecedented hardship. Spiring energy costs has led to people having to choose between heating and eating, with the UK government's support for energy bills withdrawn in March. Soaring inflation has caused food prices to increase by nearly 20% over the past year and considerably more for some staples. Continuingly rising costs due to UK government decisions, including the £100 billion cost to the UK economy of a hard Brexit, economic mismanagement under the list trust government and the ongoing impact of a decade of austerity have resulted in an even greater pressure on public service finances and pushed low-income families to breaking point. In the face of this challenge, we have had to make difficult decisions in order to prioritise immediate support to people most impacted by the cost of living crisis, as well as to meet our requirements to deliver a balanced budget, a budget which has also been reduced due to inflation. As the report sets out, we estimate that £3 billion was invested across a range of programmes targeted at low-income households last year, with £1.25 billion directly benefiting children. This represents an increase of £0.43 billion um, and £0.15 billion, respectively, compared to 21-22, and vital support at a crucial time for households. Presiding officer, the report provides the latest child poverty statistics, which relate to 21-22 and the final year of our previous tackling child poverty delivery plan. Whilst trends for poverty rates are stable on three target measures, including relative and absolute poverty, there is a low upward trend in persistent poverty. However, these levels do not yet capture the impact of the expansion and increase in the value of the Scottish Child Payment, alongside other me measures reflected within the modelling published today. The annual progress report sets out that as a result of action taken in 2022-23, 
40 of the 101 actions set out in Best Start Bright Futures are complete or ongoing, with a further 39 in progress and 19 in the early stages of development. And it outlines the action we have taken to provide immediate support to families as part of our overall approach to tackling child poverty. We have doubled our Scottish child payment to £20 a week from April 2022, delivered our planned expansion to under-16s and provided a further increase to £25 per week in November last year. This was described by anti-poverty camp organisations as a watershed moment for the tackling of child poverty in Scotland. This was an increase of 150% over eight months. It means that our five family payments, including the payment, Best Start Foods and Best Start Grants, could be worth over £10,000 by the time an eligible child turns six, over £8,000 more than is available for families in England and Wales, and over £20,000 by the time an eligible child is 16. By the end of March, 303,000 children were in receipt of the payment, very close to predictions of the Scottish Fiscal Commission. But we are not complacent, and we are committed to do everything that we can to ensure that eligible families take up this unparalleled support. Over 2022-23, we invested £84 million in discretionary housing payments to support people with housing costs and mitigate the UK Government's bedroom tax. We also worked with our local authority partners to mitigate the UK Government's unfair benefit cap as full as possible within devolved powers, backed by £8.8 million this year and last. This is expected to help up to 4,000 families with around 14,000 children, many of them lone parent households who are disproportionately impacted. In the last year, we also acted to increase the value of eight Scottish Government benefits by 6% from 1 April 22, almost double the planned rate, and have further increased 12 benefits by 10.1% from April this year, providing more money to people who need it most. Despite the significant pressures facing the Scottish Budget, we took our opportunity to go further where we could through our emergency budget review, increasing the immediate support available to families. This included doubling the final bridging payment in December 2022 to £260, with payments made in 2022 putting a total of £92 million in the pockets of families of around £100 million. 143,000 school-aged children at a time when they needed it most. We doubled investment in our fuel and security fund to 20 million, helping tens of thousands of people to meet their energy costs, and we'll triple this to 30 million pounds in the year ahead. And in addition to increasing our investment for the Scottish Welfare Fund, committing 1.4 million pounds for the island's cost crisis emergency fund and 1.8 million pounds to tackling food insecurity. We introduced emergency legislation to give tenants increased protection from rent increases and evictions. We have also taken important steps to deliver change in the longer term. For example, in early years, we have set out our approach to expanding our childcare programme over the rest of this Parliament and commenced early phasing of community-level systems of school-aged childcare, with a further £15 million committed for this important work in the year ahead. And to help drive forward the whole systems change needed, we have established new pathfinder approaches in Dundee and in Glasgow and invested £32 million in the whole family wellbeing funding to deliver a long-term shift towards earlier preventative intervention with families. So whilst we have made vital progress, we recognise that the challenging circumstances of the past year have meant that it has not been possible to deliver the levels of investment in key measures anticipated when Best Start Bright Futures was published. This included making the difficult decision to reallocate funds from our employability services to enable us to respond to the cost of living crisis. However, in the year ahead, we will make up to £108 million available for the delivery of employability support and will work with partners who significantly increase the reach of our services. Scotland's public finances are under more pressure than at any time in the Parliament's history, and we fully recognise that tough choices will need to be made about existing budgets in order to drive the progress needed, including looking at how we target our investment to deliver the greatest impact, and we will not shy away from the hard choices and tough decisions that will be needed. At the Anti-Poverty Summit, the First Minister convened in May, our stakeholders, partners and those with lived experience reinforced that the approach we are taking is the right one and that we must continue to deliver with the urgency, pace and scale required. Presiding officer, we are determined to do more to tackle and reduce child poverty. 
As is clear from what I have outlined in the past year, despite the challenges of our economic and budgetary circumstances, we have taken action to tackle child poverty head on and progress the actions set out within Best Start Bright Futures. We have provided immediate support to families impacted by the unprecedented cost of living crisis, and we have gone further to increase protections for families and mitigate the harm of UK government policies. The modelling published today reinforces that we are not just holding back the tide of poverty in Scotland, but we are turning the tide, with 90,000 fewer children expected to live in poverty this year as a result of the measures we are taking. In the coming year, we are committed to further investment to accelerate progress and will strengthen our partnership approach, including through our new deals for business and local government. As a government, we will continue to do everything within the scope of our limited powers and fixed budget to ensure that the statutory child poverty targets are met and to drive forward progress with urgency and at the scale required. And we will continue to make the case for the full powers of a normal nation so we can fully tackle poverty and create the fairer nation that we all long to see. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we will move on to the next item of business. I would be grateful if members who wish to put a question were to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. The Scottish Government claims that it has one hand tied around its back, yet it is one of if not the most powerfully devolved governments in the world. This is the same SNP government who claimed that it could set up an independent country in 18 months, yet it will take nearly nine years for them to fully devolve welfare powers after handing them back to the UK government. Turning to children in temporary accommodation, organisations such as Shelter Scotland, Poverty Alliance and Crisis have warned ministers about the record number of children in Scotland trapped in temporary accommodation. This number is up 120% since 2014. The SNP Green record on this is shameful. The Scottish Government will always try to pat themselves on the back when it comes to tackling child poverty and inequality. However, Shelter have said we cannot tolerate inaction any longer too many children are paying the price. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what is her response to this comment and why has our government not done enough to support children trapped in temporary and emergency accommodation? Cabinet Secretary. I have to say, Presiding Officer, I'm perhaps not surprised but still astonished at the sheer brass neck of a Scottish Conservative member of the Scottish Parliament coming here and saying that we should be doing more. And I'll give one example, one example of how that is difficult. At the same time as we doubled the Scottish child payment to £20 per week per eligible child, the UK government cut universal credit by the same amount. Imagine, actually, if the people of Scotland actually, for a change, had two governments that are trying to tackle child poverty than just one. So one example I could give more, presiding officer, about how it is very difficult to actually alleviate child poverty when you actually have one government in Scotland not actually doing nothing, but actually having policies that push children into poverty instead. And on the fact, when it comes to affordable housing, uh, yes, we are very committed to ensuring as a government that we are alleviating the number of people who are in temporary accommodation, particularly children. And the Minister for Housing it will be saying more on this in due course about the actions that will be taking. But for example, from April 2007 to the end of December 2022, we delivered 118,124 affordable homes to ensure that we were helping people that required that assistance. And I would say, again, to provide the context that we've delivered over three times as many socially rented homes per head of population than England over this period. Paul O'Kane. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of the statement. And whilst we should all welcome the new modelling predicting 90,000 fewer children expected to live in poverty, it is deeply concerning to see that there is an upward trend in levels of persistent poverty across Scotland. This needs serious and focused action in order for the Government to meet the targets which we agreed across this Parliament, and any issues and current interventions must be dealt with speedily. I have raised an issue before in terms of the Scottish Child Payment with the First Minister and the disparity between eligibility and uptake, with up to 60,000 children in Scotland facing missing out on receiving the payment. Therefore, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary what action she has taken to address those concerns and will she continue to look at automating that payment? Also, Presiding Officer, I think it is revealing that it was only five paragraphs into the statement on child poverty before the Cabinet Secretary shifted the focus back on to the Constitution. The reality is that people across Scotland are being failed by two governments who are too focused on their own internal issues rather than focusing on relentlessly tackling poverty. Therefore, I would ask the Cabinet Secretary, will she focus on the detail of eradicating child poverty and outline to the Chamber how the new modelling will affect the Scottish Government's ability to hit their own targets on absolute poverty, relative poverty and persistent poverty. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there was a number of points in there and I will try and cover as many as I can, presiding officer, in time. Um, Paul O'Kane quite rightly uh, points to the real concerning figures in there about pers persistent um, poverty and I, I do absolutely recognise that. Um, and he quite rightly points to the work that the government needs to undertake around the uptake of the Scottish child payment. I would add a, a, another layer onto that and that's actually about the uptake of universal credit and there's been some work that's been published recently that again shows that there are uh, many, many families right across Scotland that actually could be eligible for universal credit that uh, do not take that up. But in the, the context of Scottish child payment, there have obviously been marketing campaigns on this before, and we're very keen to make sure that we're doing more uh, this year uh, to ensure that that eligibility is, is further um, improved, particularly for the 6-16s, uh, where the number is uh, uh, slightly lower than the under-60s, which has been in uh, for more time. And I say with, with the greatest respect to, to Paul O'Kane, this isn't about a discussion about the Constitution. It's a discussion about the context. The context that we are in is a very important one when it comes to actually alleviating child poverty. And that's why that UK context is very, very important. And we would also point out gently to Paul O'Kane, and I'm quite happy to be corrected um, on this if I'm wrong, but on these aspects around welfare, there doesn't appear at this stage to be any change in some of the most concerning policies if Labour got into power. So the benefit cap, the issues around the two-child uh, clause and the impact of discretionary housing payments are still things we would have to be mitigating against even if Labour got into power. And I think that is a genuine sadness and a genuine context that this Parliament needs to take into account. And Mr O'Kane might not like the fact that his party at a UK level isn't changing his welfare policies. I would encourage him to try and make sure they do, but that context is a very important one, presiding officer, for us to take account of. Before we go on to the next question, can I just suggest that we get out of the habit of commenting constantly when other members are on their feet, both putting and responding to questions? It is wholly at odds with the requirements of the Code of Conduct. I'm uh, aware too that there are many members who wish to put a question here and we will need to pick up the pace and I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her statement. Witnesses at the Social Justice and Social Security Committee have told us about the challenges of the UK welfare system. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide data on the impact of UK government policies on child poverty in Scotland and outline how the Tories' actions are hampering Scottish government policies? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I hear groans again coming from the Scottish Tories, uh, presiding officer. They might not like uh, the question or indeed the answer, but it is an important one about context because that decade of hysteria and the welfare cuts have been hugely damaging and are driving more people into poverty. 
analysis published by the Scottish Government last year showed that reversing key UK government welfare reforms that occurred since 2015 would put £780 million into the pockets of Scottish households and lift an estimated 70,000 people out of poverty in Scotland. That is the damage that UK government policies are having um, on the people of Scotland. I call Stephen Kerr to be followed by John Swinney. The first two thematic areas in the progress report are related to employment. And the Scottish Government itself has said employment remains the best route out of poverty. And I completely agree. But this, so why is the Scottish Government cutting funding on skills, cutting funding for college places, cutting funding for apprenticeship places, creating uncertainty around funding for developing the young workforce, slashing employability support, cutting university funding? And why would, did the Withers Review conclude that this Scottish Government, this SNP Scottish Government, has failed to provide decisive leadership and direction over 16 years in any of these areas? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I have missed my, missed my exchanges with Mr Kerr since I moved on to education, but let me remind them of some of the challenges that we still have. And again, the, the real challenge around what we want to do, particularly around fair work and particularly around ensuring that work pays a respectable and a fair wage, is that employment law is reserved. And if employment law was here in the Scottish Parliament, we could be doing so much more. And for the sake of time, presiding officer, we've got a list of aspects there that Mr Kerr says the Scottish Government should be paying more on. He's also the person, incidentally, that of course thinks we should be raising less tax, which would decrease yet further the amount of money that we have to spend. So once again, we have a litany of things we should be spending money on, a demand that actually we should be raising less, and somehow expecting the Scottish Government to balance a budget that I think it says all that we need to know about the literacy of Mr Kerr's economic plans. John Swinney, to be called, followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Uh, President officer, given the survey evidence that is charted in the delivery report indicating that 97 per cent of parents and carers of three and five year olds using early learning and childcare are satisfied with the quality of that provision, how will this superb rollout of the early learning and childcare programme by the Scottish Government and our local authority partners influence the deliver, development of early learning and school-age childcare programmes that are viewed by the overwhelming majority of parents as being beneficial in helping parents enter the labour market in the future. Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank uh, Mr Swinney for his question. I, and did he is quite right to point out to the very high levels of satisfaction um, for early learning and childcare here in Scotland. Of course, we are the only part of the UK to offer that 1140 hours a year of funded ELC to all three and four year olds and eligible two year olds, putting the child first. That is about £1 billion worth of investment uh, that we are putting in to that, and it saves a family £5,000 per eligible child per year. And that success, which uh, a variety of ministers uh, should take uh, some credit for, including Mr Swinney, is something that we are absolutely determined uh, to build on as we look to improve the already most generous system of ELC that is provided here in the UK. Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Last week, councils were informed by COSLA that the funding for the holiday food programme it expected from the Scottish Government would not be forthcoming, leaving councils scrambling around their already stretched budgets, looking for other money to cover the shortfall needed to ensure food for 27,000 children this summer. Even as we passed the date of last year's funding payment, the Government still refused to give any indication on funding, limiting Council's ability to plan, and then at the 11th hour, it dealt the devastating blow. The Cabinet Secretary has just said that the Government will not shy away from hard choices and tough decisions. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does she really believe that removing funding, which could potentially leave many families struggling to feed their children this summer, is a justifiable one? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we are continuing to invest £15 million this year in building a system of school-aged childcare, as announced by the First Minister at the beginning of April. He noted that investment should be targeted at those families who need it most. And our priority now is to support and deliver meaningful and lasting change for families and community to build a system of school-aged childcare, which provides care before and after school, 
as well as during the holidays. And that has to recognise the need for reliable childcare, both before and after school, during the term time, and for full days in the holidays. That's where that focus um, has uh, been shifted um, to. Of course, if Ms Duncan Glancy would again wish for further uh, expenditure to be made on this, I would humbly suggest uh, she might have to also uh, suggest where that would come from. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. UK households have paid £7 billion since Brexit to cover the extra cost of trade barriers on food imports from the EU. And that's according to researchers at the London School of Economics. And we know that most people, or more people, sorry, are in need of food banks, although data from the Trussell Trust indicates that the Scottish child payment may have helped to slow the pace of demand for emergency food parcels here in Scotland in the last year. Can I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary what impact are rising costs having on the Scottish Government's ability to tackle child poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said in my opening statement, Presiding Officer, the hard Brexit chosen by the Scottish Conservatives and now supported by the Labour Party, it has had and will continue to have a very devastating impact on families right across Scotland. That has led to increased inflation, increased prices, and of course leading that then to the impact on families um, as we see it in the figures released today. Those rising costs and inflation also of course have impacted on our ability to tackle poverty and we've had to take tough choices to rebalance the Scottish budget which was estimated to be worth £1.7 billion less in November 2022 than it was when it was introduced to Parliament in December 2021. That does uh, give another example, I think, presiding officer, of how it is exceptionally difficult for this government to be able to assist people as much as we would like, although we are determined to do so and to meet our statutory targets. Thank you. Parliament has agreed that this item finish in, in approximately half a minute, but we have several members who would still wish to put a question. If members could keep the questions and responses concise, we'll endeavour to get more members in. And I call Willie Rennie to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. It, these reports are, are a difficult read on some poverty measures. It's just stable. And on others, in terms of persistent poverty, it's an upward trend. And this is despite the Scottish Government spending a significant increase amount of money in Social Security. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us how much she estimates it would cost to completely eradicate child poverty? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Mr Rennie poses a very hypothetical uh, uh, question, um, but it is a, a, a very interesting one. Uh, can I say that it's not... Uh, what makes it more difficult... Um, and it's again before anyone groans about providing the context of which we're working in, is that we're working to be able to mitigate child poverty, to take people out of child poverty, but we are seeing uh, implications of, poverty, uh, of policies elsewhere that are dragging people back in. So how much we have to spend very much depends on, for example, would the UK government take action to have a real living wage right across this UK to ensure that we're delivering a way out of poverty meaningfully uh, when people uh, go into work. So I give that as but one example about why I can't give a specific answer to that, uh, but I hope the modelling that we've presented today does help to go along the way. Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A report from the Child Poverty Action Group shows that the cost of bringing up a child in Scotland is lowered by 31% on nearly £24,000, with the doubling of the Scottish child payment and once the expansion of free school meals is delivered. If this is what can be achieved with limited resources and powers, how much further could we go if we had full powers? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As we've demonstrated in the modelling that's been published today, the government's focus on tackling child poverty is making uh, a significant um, difference. Uh, the impact not just of the Scottish child payment but of the 1140 hours um, um, is something that is very significant. I think one of the real challenges we have with the powers that we have is our constant requirement to mitigate, whether that's against the benefit cap, uh, whether it's around other aspects of the current UK system that makes it very difficult uh, for us to be able to lift children out of poverty. And imagine what the debate we could have in this chamber if we did not have to spend that money mitigating, but could actually have a discussion around how we could use that money to actually lift more children out of poverty quicker than we can at the moment. 
Miles Briggs to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, President yeah. Officer. In 2016, SNP ministers pledged to deliver a national allowance for children living in kinship care. Kinship carers play a vital role in providing caring and nurturing homes. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why have ministers failed to deliver on their 2016 pledge? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I thank Miles Briggs for his, his, his uh, continuing interest in this really um, um, important um, issue and one which I've uh, discussed with him uh, previously. He knows, uh, I know, that this is uh, not simply uh, to, about the Scottish Government, but also our work in, with COSLA and with local authorities to put that into place. So I'd be happy to ensure that the Minister with responsible responsibility for kinship care uh, gives him an update on where those negotiations are at this time. Maggie Chapman to be followed by Stuart McMillan. I thank the, the Cabinet Secretary for adv advance sight of her statement. Increased problem debt is likely to be a long-term implication of the cost of living crisis, with households managing extremely limited finances or negative incomes, and we know this will disproportionately affect women and single-parent households. Will the Scottish Government consider stopping the collection of public sector debt for a period of at least six months to help households use that money on essentials like food, energy and housing costs? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Maggie Chapman for, for raising a very important issue about the, the number of people uh, that are experiencing debt or even the fear of going into debt on this. Uh, clearly, she'll also be aware that when we talk about public sector debt, uh, there is a, a number of actors involved in that, most obviously local government, but not just uh, local government. So this isn't an issue that the Scottish Government uh, can take on um, itself. Clearly, uh, a number of local authorities um, have taken a decision uh, to uh, eradicate some of the debt in some areas. Uh, I can think of uh, some, for example, that have looked at the debt around free school meals uh, or sc uh, school meal debt, uh, but there is something for individual local authorities to have a position on. And Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Jenny Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary let me know what the response is to the reports that highlight that more than two thirds of children in poverty live in working households? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is uh, absolutely unacceptable that two thirds of children living in poverty live in a household where at least one person is at uh, work. Uh, that is a deeply concerning issue, and that is why the action that we are taking around the drivers of poverty reduction includes significant investment in Scottish gov be government benefits to be able to assist with that, and also around employability services. But I go back to a point that I made before, Presiding Officer, about the real need for UK-wide, because that is where the power lies, to actually ensure that we have a fair work agenda and a real living wage right across the UK to ensure that work is genuinely a way out of poverty. Thank you. That concludes the ministerial statement. There will be a small pause before we move on to the next item of business. <laughs>